Hi, everyone. Welcome to the BizDev Podcast, the podcast about developing your business. I'm David Baxter, your host, and I'm joined today, as always, by creative director Gary Voigt. No you know, I realize today. I've never actually used your real talent, your, your real title. So, and talent. hey, there you, go. you know, thanks. And Appreciate talent. That. No, you have no talent whatsoever, but we've got you as the creative director. So that is actually his his title, um, his real job, not the 24 other ones I've given him and the 24 more I will add later, but there we go. We are also joined today by Michael Davis, who is the CEO of Uptone Pictures. And we're going to learn more about that in just a little bit. Um, but first I want to finish our series that we've been doing with our guests on time management. Um, Michael, one of the things we've been doing with our last several weeks with our guests is figuring out how they manage their time. Because I realized several weeks ago that time management for CEOs and founders and such is a little different than most because our job is to give away our job. And so when we do that, that leaves us with weird tasks left over. And sometimes that means time management for some people, it's very easy and other people it's very difficult. So I'm curious, where do you find fall on the spectrum? How do you manage your time and what do you find yourself doing on an average day to day basis? Well, I mean, I, 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 um, I, I guess I proud myself a little bit on being a multitasker. I guess you have to be. And, and so I try to maximize time by doing multiple things. And, and uh, that's one way that, you know, and uh, I also try to delegate as much as I can or you know, outsource in some cases other things so that I can focus on what I feel is important for, my, for, my, uh, for the business and what we're doing or the project that we're on. And, uh, and that way, you know, again, we can focus on that and, and get the other things done. So what is it that takes up your day on a regular Monday, Wednesday, uh, or Thursday? I don't have just, a... Is it a bunch of meetings or is it... Uh, every, well, my days are pretty... Like my Monday is completely different than my Friday. And <laughs> uh, Mondays are pretty much a lot of meetings and, or you know, kind of setting the week up, you know, and what we're, you know, planning to do and, and that kind of thing. Uh, the rest of the week is, uh, is it, it, it can vary. Um, in, in our business, you know, being a film production company, um, it changes dramatically from, you know, I could be on set tomorrow or uh, like last week I was in Los Angeles in meetings with people um, and partners that we work with. Um, this week I'm not. Uh, you know, uh, in December... You know, we were in Amsterdam and we were in the UK and other places, uh, uh, Guatemala. So, you know, it, it really changes. I don't have a set like, you know, Monday through Friday, I'm in, at, in an office doing whatever. Mm -hmm. so I'm mobile. So, you know, I, I, we were in, you know, I'll, I'll, if I'm on the road, I'm still doing a lot of the same things, even if I'm in my office. With that kind of a schedule, I assume that you use some sort of time management system, whether it's not your day to day, but are there certain apps or anything that your company uses to kind of keep track of scheduling? Oh, I use a ton of apps. <laughs> yeah. We use Trello Any favorites? and uh, I use Trello and uh, Slack and uh, a number of other, you know, uh, uh, for our social media, Hootsuite, you know, just a bunch of different things to be able to uh, maximize time and, and, and delegate for your personal time. Do you do anything like writing down little task lists for the day or do you have any way of, I have a little notepad where I write stuff down, like things I want to get done in the day and, or the week, depending on what we're doing. So what is your definition when you're running your company and you're, and you're doing your myriad of tasks, what is a successful week for you? Is it, I, check these boxes and I got these things done? Or is it more of I'm moving towards a much larger goal, like yeah, three months, we need to do these 27 things and I move forward on that. What do you consider a successful productive day for you? Um, I think that, you know, first of all, if I'm able to get everything on my list done, that's always a success. Um, I think that also depending on the pro you know project and what, what I'm doing, uh, it varies. So if I'm like, for example, you know, last summer we were shooting a movie and I was on set every day for eight weeks, you know, getting that project done was, you know, every week getting stuff in the can and getting the film shot, you know, it was both on a, you know, from a micro perspective, getting the day done, meeting our day without going over. Cause if you go over your, you, obviously your budget is, 
going out the window. So you got to manage your day. If you manage your days, you're going to manage your week. If you manage your week, you're going to manage the show. So, you know, it's, it kind of boils down that way. Man, I find the entertainment industry super interesting. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm, I'm eager to dive into that a little bit. A lot of people think it's glamorous. It's not as glamorous as people think, um, but it is better than digging the, you know, working on the road somewhere, I guess, or doing some yeah. hard labor <laughs> that, you know, I, I don't know if I could do that. So. so let's back up. So tell me about Uptone Pictures. Tell me about what you guys do, how you guys started, all that good stuff. Well, Uptone Pictures is in its 23rd year. Uh, we started in 2000. Um, I had been working, I came from the ad agency background and, uh, worked for a number of players back in the day. And, uh, I was tasked, I was working for a kind of a production. There was an agency that had its own production component, production house, so to speak in house and was doing a lot of things. And we, uh, I was tasked to, they decided to cr start creating content. And the first project that they did was a kids animated feature. Um, this was when, you know, Maya and some of the early, uh, animated cartoons were coming out. And so I was taxed to kind of oversee that project and, um, ended up selling it to Sony, a division of Sony. Um, and, uh, shortly thereafter, I found that where they wanted to go and some of the things they wanted to do, uh, was starting to be different than what I felt like I should be doing. So I started Uptone Pictures in the year 2000, um, and uh, the relationship I had established with the folks over at, at this, uh, it was uh, Provident, which is now a firm. It's, it's changed different names over the years, but um, back in the day, they, um, they were based out of Nashville. That division of Sony was, and um, had a good relationship with them, and they, they asked me to keep bringing product to them. And so for a few years, I all I did was kind of help other producers that had content get it to market. And and in that process, I kind of got a, a master's degree, I suppose, or something similar in distribution and, you know, sales. I had come from a sales kind of background originally. And so that kind of naturally flowed for me. And But then finally, I was like, you know, I'm helping all these people do their projects. Um, I like to start doing my own, you know? And so... Uh, I think it was 2007, 2008, we started creating our own content and have since gone on to produce 18 feature length films and, uh, um, uh, both of our own and for others, but, um, and wow. then, um, the company is basically, a, a full service production facility that, uh, in a, you know, we create content, um, feature films, television shows, documentaries, you know, really the, the spectrum of any visual type product that goes to market um and then we have a i've started a second company called seven worldwide which basically still helps produce others with their content like i did back in the day and have been helping other producers still uh even now with uh and we manage about five or six clients that um and, and with their content and getting it to market and helping them develop it and brand it and so forth you mentioned i just want to ask a quick question you mentioned uh, creating animations in Maya, and uh, I remember mm -hmm. when Maya came out and it blew everybody's mind. <laughs> I was actually I was learning, you know, other lower level animation and three D programs at the time. But um, were you actually creating the stuff as well, or were you more in the like management leadership role? You personally, I mean. Oh, you... I, I yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't an. I've never been a. You know, I didn't. I wasn't on the computer actually doing the the animation work, but I did. You know, I followed a lot of it to learn because I wanted to understand a little bit of obviously the technology and what was going on. But no, I'm not. I wasn't a animator myself. We actually, I was more of in the uh, as a producer role or executive producer role, whatever you would call it at the time, kind of supervising the production in terms of the overall, you know, project. Did that morph and, uh, the animation morph into? giving you even like some VFX chops for your team to do visual effects production or did it kind of stay in? Well, that uh, it should have. And unfortunately, unfortunately that whole thing kind of, as I said earlier, it, they, they wanted to do some things that I really wasn't 
keen on and there were some issues with the company that I really don't want to get into but um okay. and at that point I felt like you know what they're uh, this is not I, I need to go do my own thing so I left at that point so is VFX something that Uptone Pictures does offer um I actually work um I have a number of friends that in the animation space in the in the visual effects space um that I, I we work with as partners that okay. come in as kind of a they're not they're not necessarily part of Uptone but it's something that we can do uh through them um and these guys you know come from Fox Animation and uh Lucas Films and things like that so you know high end you know everything from mocap to to other types of digital technology that you know used for uh, VFX work but um, but they're very good friends of ours, and they focus on that that piece. So yeah. uh, typically they'll very come cool. in as part of our team in in a project. But I don't necessarily have to cover the overhead. Now, in a previous episode, we had um, someone who was heavily involved in game development, and that's David's yep. wheelhouse. And he kind of just nerded out and leaned in, listened to everything. Now you're talking <laughs> about film. Well, film production, but just, you know, basically creating visuals, whether it's VFX or, or just video, like that's, that's something that I'm super interested in. So that's why I'm asking yeah. all these little fanboy questions. Sorry. <laughs> I want to back up for a second. I am ignorant with all things film, except for a regular, you know, movie buff, as it were. When I think of movies, I'm thinking of big blockbusters in theaters, all of that kind of stuff, thousands of theaters, you know, Marvel, whatever. But there's a whole nother world where there are smaller pictures. Mm. And that seems to be, I, I mean, I haven't seen your movies in the big blockbuster. So I assume that's your world, that you're you're living in a different thing that's not in 5,000 theaters in a weekend or whatever. Uh, not necessarily 5,000, um, but we are, you know, my films have been in theaters. My, my So they do go to theaters. theaters? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, limited releases, they can be 150, 200, 500 screens, you know. They may not get up to the 5,000. Sure. I mean, uh, and a lot of that is just based on your marketing dollars that you have because it just costs, you know, it's like three to five grand per market, per, per theater for you to, to put it in there. You know, we do that, but on a scale, right? So where Marvel can go out to 5,000 because they have $92 million to spend on just, sure. you know, marketing and advertising. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we don't have necessarily that luxury, but we can still get it in theaters and we can still um, in that, you know, uh, this last film, uh, you know, we we that's why we were in Amsterdam. We did a, you know, a European release there and a lot of the we've sold it in, I think, seven or eight countries internationally now because it was in theaters in the United States. So, um, okay. you know, you pick you pick the markets based on where you think your product will do well. Well, and I, I ask that not because of, you know, to say that's worse in some way. I'm just, it's a different world, right? Because yeah. again, we're thinking of most people, just average Joes like myself when it comes to movies, think all we know of are the movies that hit all the screens, Avatar and whatnot. Right. But there's a whole other market here. And that's where, I, so you make some money by going to the theaters and you make some money selling rights to Amazon and stuff. But like, where does that, most of your revenue come from? Is it just a bunch of deals all over and and you make a little bit from a lot of places? Yeah, I mean, you, you do, you know, if you do well in the box office and you get a good streaming, pro, you know, stream, streaming or broadcast deal, um, you know, those that, that can recoup your investment. And then, you know, our, our goal typically has been, you know, you, you do a, a, dis, a domestic distribution deal uh, theatrically and then streaming. And even, I mean, believe it or not, there's still a market. Uh, Walmart still sells DVDs and Blu-rays, believe it or not. And people mm, don't realize yeah. that, but there is still a market for that, even in America. And, and Walmart will still buy your product. So if it's good. And uh, so those are kind of your, you know, main revenue streams. Then, you know, depending on the project and what it involves, there could be ancillary things. You know, there could be a, you know, a, I did a faith-based film, for example, and they created a whole study guide thing for using the film. And, and that became an ancillary product that almost did as well as the movie. You know what I mean? So there are different mm -hmm. ways for you to monetize that. Um, but, and then your foreign becomes kind of your gravy money or your profit, you know, as you, you sell it. And I'm always amazed that people in, you know, countries that you, you see on a map, but you have no idea 
that there are these there's consumers there that are going to buy your film so now does that entail translation and closed captioning and, and stuff as well is there any post-production that has to happen in your deliverables you t i have at least our company has always had this um uh, idea and this uh, protocol that we we do what they call an m e track which is when you export the film out from the the edit bay for your mastering process you do an extra pass or an extra export which involves you take everything out but i mean excuse me you take the 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 dialogue out but everything else stays so music and effects stay but all the dialogue is taken out of the film and you export it that way and then you mm -hmm. deliver that to an international market so that they can dub it into their own language with their actors and you provide a script and a, a what they call a dialogue script which is an actual time script based on the actual movie not the original script that you shot with and a few other deliverables and then they go and go in a studio record it and put that voiceover on the top and re-export it there in their language i have a question you so said you started in 2000 right yes i'm assuming that since then the with the way the internet and streaming services have erupted that has to have changed and helped your business as far as being a video production or you know movie production company as far as your Honestly, channels for distribution it must have opened up a lot of doors yes um there are i mean today there's a lot of fragmentation um there's a number of you know things that have happened industry-wide um back in the day in the in the you know the the golden days or whatever you want to call it that you know it was great because you could sell it in in you could do the theatrical you had a a known quantity in terms of dvd or what they call hard goods sales so that became that was like a second tier but it was a solid like hey if i can sell x amount of units in walmart or target or wherever i'm gonna make you know i can monitor i can basically establish what where I'm going to end up. And then the streaming was kind of an extra, right? And broadcast and those other windows became extra things that you could do. Um, and now it's not, you know, it's kind of flipped. So th there was a shift, but then the way the market kind of adjusted, everybody's just kind of evolving back to, I guess, streaming or, or digital video would be more of the new normal instead of just cable. And, and yeah, and I but I think it's an ever evolving, you know, situation. I would imagine so we we our goal with the podcast is to talk to business owners and to extrapolate universal truths about business and running businesses. And in my head I'm struggling to your business is so unique that it's it it's so interesting and you have unique challenges that someone starting up a, a restaurant does not, right? And I guess that's true for every business, but it, it is, you're wearing so many hats and you're doing so many different things because unlike, you know, again, a restaurant being just an example or making clothes, you have a single thing, but in order to make your, a, a movie is like 47 specialties all stuck together. And your job is- That's why, that's why I tell people if it were easy, everybody would be doing it. And number two, you know, for you to, I tell people, uh, if you don't believe in miracles, watch somebody make a movie. And that's <laughs> like, you know, even a, a movie that sucks, I take my hat off to them because at least they got it done. Cause like you said, you know, there, there are so many, there are so many fingers in the pie. There are so many people that are involved that any one little thing can screw up your whole Best product, boy gaffer. you know, whereas, you know, yeah. I mean, if, if the if the if you don't have a good sound guy, all of a sudden your sound sucks. I mean, you have to go fix that. There's an you know that's a huge problem. If all of a sudden you know some other you had a camera problem or you know or you know whatever. There's just so many different elements. The editor can screw it all up, or you know there's a fire and your your all your stuff burns. You know you're you're done. You know for after months and months of work. So. It, it really is a complicated um, Tetris game that you play as, as, an, in, in, as you said, this is an independent filmmaking world or non, you know, studio based, you know. And so we, we spend a lot of time fundraising. We spend a lot of time marketing. We spend a lot of time getting things done. I always kid with people. We spend 90 percent of our time doing, you know, raising money and doing all these other things so we can do 10 percent, which is our 
is actually making the product, you know? How, if I was an aspiring, I was you. So we, we always ask the top three things and that's very generic about business in general, how you would help a business person. And I don't want to get there yet. What I want to ask specifically is if I wanted to be you, I am you in 1999. Now your, your track is a little different, right? Cause you came from marketing and an agency, but let's just say I'm a, I'm a passionate filmmaker and I want to dive in. What would you say to that passionate, again, very specific to your industry? Cause they don't know what they're getting into and you do. <laughs> well, I tell, you know, I've, I've had that, ha I've had that question thrown to me, you know, you know, college students or whatever, they just graduated and they're like, how do, what do I do? And I'm like, well, I wish I'd talked to you four years ago because I don't think you need a college degree, number one. Uh, I know all the film colleges and universities are going to hate me for saying that, but the reality is, and I tell this story and I've told it a gazillion times and I'll t tell it to you. I had this girl come up to me. She had graduated from college. She walked up and said, and I, we were shooting a movie here uh, in North Carolina where I live and, and I had hired everybody, you know, and she came to me and was like, look, I really want to get in this business. I really want to, you know, this is what I went to school for and I, is there anything I can do? I said, look, I, I really, as much as I would love to, I don't have an actual job for you, but I will, I'll do this. If you're willing to come, um, I'll, I will cover all of your gas and I will, uh, you know, you bring me receipts, I'll re reimburse you for any expenses. And I, you know, and, and you, we'll put you to work here and, and you, you can count it as a college, you know, credit or, you know, internship kind of situation. That's the best I can offer. I, and I truly was at a situation where I couldn't, I didn't have any more money in the budget to hire someone else. She was, a, you know, uh, as we shot over six or seven weeks, she was always the first one to arrive, last one to leave. That, just that alone um, caught the attention of some of the people in one of the other departments. They ended up hiring her to work for them on, because most of these people have, you know, while they're working on your show, you know, they're already looking at what's the next show that I'm going to work on. And they've already, you know, they're talking, they've got four or five shows in the, in the wind, you know, and that they're, they're working with and they took her. And, you know, in short order that year, she probably did nine feature length films. Um, and today, I don't know. If, <laughs> I mean, I, I could afford her, I'm sure, but you know, her rates are, you know, she's working on major shows in Atlanta and, she, you know, is a department head and she's been doing this, you know. And so I would tell people, if you're a passionate filmmaker, instead of going, spending $200,000 and going to college, spend that 200000 on yourself and get into, you know, go work for free or even, you know, for whatever and mm. learn every aspect of the business, you know, start at the lowest level, you know, be a PA, get into some other department, try this. If that's your passion, if you're, a, you know, if you like photography, you know, work, try to get into the film, the camera department, even as an assistant at first, you know, and it may take you a while, but all of a sudden, if you're good and if you are talented, uh, they're just like in sports, they're looking for people that are, you can spot them. You're like, you know what? That kid can do it, you know, and, and they'll get called and they'll get moved up quickly. And, and so, that's what I would recommend to people, you know, is it, it's the little things that, you know, unfortunately I see what I see in nowadays, especially when it comes to the, the work ethic is, you know, those <laughs> that show up on time, number one, uh, those that actually don't leave and don't come back at lunch, you know, uh, and, you know, can actually fulfill a day's work um, and are always willing to do and learn will always be promoted, will always get enhancement and will always, you know, further their career and be successful. I love that. And it's, it's true for any industry. My son, who's 17, I tell him all the time, and I can't take credit for this. I think Dave Ramsey actually said it first. He says, if you want to get promoted, you come in five minutes early and stay five minutes late and that will get you noticed. And, and it's funny. It's just that little bit. And and I, I think that's true for almost any industry. Yep. I want to shift gears for a second. Yep. I have a belief. So this will get to a question, I promise. I have a belief that every single person, especially business owners, have a superpower <laughs> that makes them able to do what very few people can do. Mine is I find every everything interesting. And that helps a lot with our clients. <laughs> I find everything interesting, which is a big part of this podcast. 
what is your superpower to the best of your bit? What do you do better than almost anyone else that allows you to do what you do? Because you have to have one. It's a tough question, though. It is a tough question. Um, I would probably say, you know, that a positive attitude and energy or and I don't know how you what the word is for that. Sure. But, you know, I am a very optimistic person. And and I think in my business, um, dealing with, um, you know, uh, I'm a problem solver. So that's really all we do all day as producing mm-hmm. content is, you know, this happened, that happened, fix this, do that. This guy has got, a, you know, you, you, you've got a myriad of problems that you're solving all day. So keeping, you know, a positive attitude and being, have high energy and excitement and uh, being, uh, you know, that being like that, I think is something that has set us apart um, in some ways. It's like a Ted Lasso. It's good. <laughs> I've been yeah. watching that show. I love that whole concept of this, he's just a good person and that's all he needs to be. And it, it cause, and that has allowed that whole show to be driven. It's just his niceness, right. his optimism and stuff like that. So it sounds like you're all Ted Lasso type. Yeah. I mean, and there's an, as a reference, you know, a great, there's a, there's a show out called the offer. I don't know if you've seen it. It's, it's like how they made the Godfather series and how that oh, all cool. came together. I saw and, the trailer. Uh, that is a, an amazing, and that, the, the one character I identify so, I mean, in, in real life, I identify with that character because that's what I do, you know, and have to deal with all, you know, it's like you get the call from the, I've never had this, but you get, it's like getting a call from the mafia, you know, and you got to go deal with this, you know, mob boss or something. And, and I never gotten to that point, of course, but, you know, I have had to deal with pretty, you know, weird situations in, in, no. in you know, I can with, only imagine, you know, or, or a union, you know, and with the union boss, you know, and we shot a movie during COVID and having to deal with all that, you know, and so all of those kinds of things. Yeah, I can, I'm definitely in that mix with the Ted Lasso. I love it. Do you have a standout project that you would call, I guess your most, I don't want to say your biggest accomplishment because obviously you've had many since the year 2000, but do you have any standout projects that, you feel as though is like the best representation? Well, there's a couple, I, uh, unfortunately, I don't know that I, I'm still striving to get the one that I really feel like, you know, the day I get the Oscar, I guess I will say that's the one, right? But <laughs> um, there are a couple films that I've done that I've been very proud of for a number, for different reasons. Um, so I did a movie, it's not been real popular in the United States because it was based on a, I'm originally from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, I grew oh. up there. My mother's Brazilian. Um, and, okay. uh, and so there was a book that was popular in Brazil and ended up working with some guys there and produced the movie based on this book uh, called three it, it translated into English. It's basically three lives, one destiny would be the kind of the tran- literal translation. Um, and they wanted to make this but they wanted to do it in English. And so we shot it with American actors here in the U S and then when we took it to Brazil, we dubbed it in Portuguese and released it theatrically. And it was the craziest thing I've ever been part of because we beat 007 Skyfall and we were the number one movie in all of Brazil. And I'm getting calls from like the equivalent of the wall street journal or the New York times and time magazine. I mean, just one after the other, like awesome major publications going who are you what is this because it was we came out of nowhere it wasn't you know but there's i don't know if it's still on there but there were facebook posts and things of literally lines out the theater i mean they were and they were taking we were taking it got so crazy that they were take they, they were there were sessions where they were showing skyfall and there were nobody was in there so they put our movie in, took Skyfall out, and let people in because there was a line out the door. Um, That's incredible. And this was being man. shown on Facebook. I mean, it was it was insane. So for that reason, um, you know, uh, that was kind of a, a fun situation to be in and and to kind of experience a little bit of that success of being of being part of something that just organically got big. Um, I don't know yeah. that it was much about us as much as the story just connected. It was the right place, right time, and people got behind it. 
Um, and then on a different reason, you know, I, I mentioned it earlier, I did this Civil War movie called Union Bound. And, you know, it it was for me personally was really interesting because I learned all about the Civil War in a whole new way. that's <laughs> not taught in schools. And, I, you know, we I tra traversed all of North Carolina where we shot it looking for the locations and ended up meeting all these people and actually went to all of the battlefields and forts and you know and and you read in the in your history book you know this fort and you go there and it's you know it's 30 feet by 30 feet by 30 feet it's yeah you know, two rocks and like an this, old tree <laughs> yeah it's like not this you have a vision in your mind that it was this you know you're thinking of you know i don't know movies that you show these big you know yeah like the remains of an alamo or something when it's yeah. basically it was just an and outpost it was, with a few rocks still there blowing. i'm like what you know and so for <laughs> me personally that film helped me understand uh you know as someone that grew up outside of the united states and um i had a whole new appreciation and a whole new kind of understanding of some of the things that were going on the film did very very well in um uh, at that time, uh, we we were on the tail end of the the DVD and Blu-ray market, and it it sold out in uh, across America and, and WalMarts all across America, and um, it was in the theaters for a little bit. Um, we we're about two hundred screens, and then it went to Walmart, and then it's been on streaming ever since, and continues to 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 do well. Awesome. Now we do have to ask you our final question. Um, uh -oh. We touched on it a little bit before. David mentioned it, but now try to think of just as a businessman overall what three pieces of advice would you give to any new entrepreneur or anybody starting a business on their own don't give up on your dream um surround yourself with the best people you can that will help you not just say yes to answer you know to make you happy but can help challenge you positively and and constructively help you um, do, you know, continue. And, uh, number three is, you know, you know what, provide the best customer service you can possibly provide to your customer base or whatever that may be. Um, and if that means in my case, it's like answering emails on time or, you know, making your, if you have an appointment being there on time, um, if it's, if you're, you know, if, if you have a hard good that you're selling that your people that are selling that product or your sales staff or your, your front people, uh, are treat your customers well. And I find the businesses that have that in today's environment are being successful. Uh, I think people, uh, I, I believe that customer service has gone out the window in most cases. Um, people don't, they don't care. There seems to be a, a, a difference like what you were saying a lot of businesses you tend to feel like they don't care but then there are some small businesses that put out that extra effort for customer service and it seems like that drives a lot of their recurring business they're almost oh, selling yeah. the and, service more than the product at that point yeah so. and and they're not you know they're not struggling they're you know they're enhancing or they're you know adding <laughs> they're expanding uh, I find that, you know, because people are tired, you know, I think it's so different because on average, and I'm not, you know, speaking ill of people, but I think that on average, the customer service has gone down in, in across the board. And so when someone is a little bit, like you said, you get there five minutes early and, or leave and, you know, and leave five minutes late, um, your, your, that alone makes a big difference. So those little things is what makes a difference. And I think that's what's going to make you successful. I love it. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I find it so interesting that every business owner, they have these jewels. And I think that's the first time we've heard customer service, but I think that one is so, so critical. And I think every company, I don't care what your business is, you can do better in customer service. You're going to serve your com your company very, very well. Because right. like you said, I think it's, even if it's not true, that customer service on some sort of global level has not gone down. The perception is that it has, that everyone's right. gone, you know, they've, they're, they're, they don't care anymore. It's, it's all automated. It's all you know, scripted emails. If you can put that human touch in there, 
Man, yeah. It makes a huge difference. Maybe that's it. Maybe customer service hasn't gone down. There's just been some companies that have learned how to do it better by adding that extra touch, which then by comparison, you're looking at the standard as going not as good as the new guys. I mean, I, I can just say like, you know, a lot of, you know, especially web-based type businesses, you know, you have to send an email or contact us and you don't actually, you talk, you don't really talk to someone if you have a problem. And, uh, and then those that do have an actual customer service that you can call or talk to a live person. Uh, not just I think the it's chat <laughs> Yeah. Now, yeah, and, now it's all chat. You know, and I, I get it. You know, people are trying to cut their margin, you know, they want to keep their profits and they're trying to, you know, so they're finding, you know, solutions that they think, you know, make it easier, but the human touch and, and doing what you like, if you say you're going to do something, do it, you know, if you're going to say you're going to deliver this, deliver it. If you're going to provide this service, provide it, you know, and, and that's, what's going to set you apart. The little, I just think little things we've so many times we get all caught up in these, you know, strategies and these whole thing of that, you know, organizational tools and all this kind of stuff. And sometimes it's just the, the very small common sense things that get forgotten that if you do, you're going to be successful. Now, if people so, want to find your work, yeah, there is. Okay, all right. Sorry. Uh, my work is all over, but you can, I mean, you go to our website, uptonepictures.com. You can uh, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, you can, uh, but all of our, I mean, our products are on, you know, Amazon, Netflix, Hulu, um, you know, just everywhere, uh, different places, um, and not just in the United States, in, you know, on a global scale. So if people wanted to see so what cool. you have been a part of, are, is that list of the products that you've created on your website, up to um, It's not on my, necessarily on my website. I mean, if they use IMDB, that's, you know, the okay. industry that's a good standard resource. place all right. that can see all of my films, a wide range of, you know, stuff, you know, I've done everything from, um, I have not done a big comedy yet, but that's in the, that's in the works, but you know, dramas and thrillers and whodunit movies, you know, inspiring family faith films, you know, so true stories, you know, I, I really gravitate to, you know, st stories of people that have accomplished stuff or did something, um, unique that made you know, set them apart. Uh, no different than this, what you're doing with your podcast and, in, 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 you know, telling stories of people and hopefully inspiring others in what they do. You can take a nugget from this or that to, to enhance your, your business. Um, I like telling stories, you know, real stories of people that made a difference. You know, as a matter of fact, I'll leave with this. My la you know, one of my favorite movies of all time is a, a film that came out a long time ago called October Sky. And I don't know if you've ever seen that, but if you can go watch it because it's, it's a story about the little guy that overcame, you know, something that uh, it's a kid that grew up in the coal mines of West Virginia and was the first kid to get out of his school, get a scholarship for math. And then it, you know, was later in his life was the guy that designed the rocket booster that took the space shuttle into space. Um, that's a pretty cool story. And uh, there are many, many stories of people that have done extraordinary things that I wish would be told because we can learn so much from that. Great way to end it. Gary, if someone wanted to get in touch with us, how would they do that? If you had any questions or comments for us, you can leave it below this video in the comment section, or you can reach out via email at hello at the big net. You can also follow us and interact with us on any of our social media channels. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for joining us. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you guys. It was my pleasure. You guys have a wonderful day. Yeah, it was great talking to you. Learned a lot. And uh, thank you so much for just meeting with us and going over that yeah. industry stuff. Do it again sometime. <laughs> Love it. All right.